There's so many strategies for learning and building your watercolor skills. Today I wanted to talk about one of my personal favorites and that includes stepping out of your comfort zone and tackling a new palette, a whole new set of colors that you may not be used to. If you've seen any of my previous videos and you're a little bit familiar with my work, you know that I always lean towards vibrant pinks and purples. I have some of my favorite blues that pop up here and there, but in general, I stay within that vibrant botanical kind of side of the spectrum. To challenge myself, I decided to go all the way towards the earthy browns. And I picked this reference photo, which I will link in the video description below so you can follow along or practice in your own time but what i wanted to do is really forget about all my favorite colors and apply the techniques that i'm familiar with using these new pigments and i'm going to try all sorts of different browns maybe a little bit of indigo and show you step by step how i've arrived at this final watercolor of the mousse. So I'm going to sketch out my mousse and uh, I'm using Etcher Cold Pressed Sketchbook and while I'm painting I will be answering all the questions that you submitted here on YouTube and also on Facebook. We haven't done a Q&A in a while so this is a great opportunity to chat about all the things that are maybe on your mind and hopefully I'll be able to help you resolve some of these watercolor problems that you're experiencing and give you some helpful tips and strategies that you can implement right away in your practice. So here's my outline, fairly close to the reference photo. I'm going to start painting in sections, starting on the top left because I'm right-handed. And as always, I'm wearing my smudge guard, this little glove to further protect my hand from smudges, which is one of the questions that comes up all the time. Guys, this is just a thin glove that's covering the back of my hand and it's designed for digital artists. As some of you know, I work a lot on my iPad in my so-called let's call it a day job where I create designs for Canadian money so that's how I discovered this glove and it helps just as much for traditional mediums simply protecting a part of your hand that may be touching the surface you're working on and I find it super helpful I will leave a few links to these gloves in the video description below I buy them on Amazon now, as you can see, I'm transitioning from yellow ochre to more saturated blues and all the way to indigo, which is almost black. I very rarely use black watercolors because I like sort of a softer look. So indigo is my substitute for black typically, and it blends really well with blues. So that's what I'm using around the hoofs in particular. So the next question I'm going to answer is actually about the ochre. And the question is, is there a yellow ochre paint you recommend? I struggle with this color since it's often very opaque. So here I'm using yellow ochre from Windsor Newton. It is quite creamy, not fully opaque, but as you can see, I'm diluting it quite a bit with water because ochres do often feel rather creamy and opaque when fully saturated, but not all of them are opaque. Some of them are actually transparent and you can try different kinds. I would recommend before investing in the tube, try dot chart. They're very affordable and as you can see here I have the Daniel Smith dot chart, lots of different ochres to choose from including Verona gold ochre, totally transparent. So you have lots and lots of options. As I mentioned, Windsor Newton is the ochre that I'm using here and uh, you can never go wrong with this brand do use lots of water when you're working with ochres and it will alleviate some of that issue that you're experiencing with the color being not fully transparent. I'm starting to introduce permanent brown here and I can't say that I like it, maybe just not very used to it. I typically use an orangey kind of brown that's transparent and staining, quinacridone burnt orange it's called and it's a lot more vibrant. This one is a lot more muted compared to my regular brown, but again it might just be that I'm not used to it. I'm also trying to play around a little bit with burnt sienna that I'm more familiar with on the nose of the mousse. So just really experimenting with different 
pigments in this side of the spectrum to see which ones I would ultimately choose if I were to paint a larger version of this. So far I'm much more happier with the way the head of the moose turned out because I went a bit too saturated, too fast on the legs and now of course it's going to stay this way so it will be difficult for me to add any more value in that area on the legs but I will still try in the second layer. How do you avoid the base layer lifting on the second and third pass? Great question and uh, Joanna already answered it better than I could even answer because she's very succinct and to the point. So thank you Joanna and I really don't have much more to add other than let the first layer dry out completely and if you need two hours depending on the climate you're in then you will need two hours. Sometimes I leave very large layers to dry out overnight before starting the new one and of course using staining pigments helps because they don't lift as easy as uh, non-staining ones. How do you create a big smooth light wash? Well uh, you need cotton paper at least 50% if not a hundred. You want to put your paper slightly on an angle so that you're working with gravity and anytime you add more color into your wash it flows down and spreads more evenly. You also want a larger, maybe flat brush so that you don't get a lot of streaks and you want to pre-mix a large amount of paint because what happens very often is if you dip into the well, this happens to me all the time by the way, you can accidentally grab more paint that you intend and then you're gonna get a streak in your wash that you can't quite lift and then the whole thing doesn't look smooth. The most important thing of course is when you're doing large washes you're using lots of water so your paper might buckle. So either pre-stretch it or use blocks which is what I'm using where your paper is already pre-stretched stretched and you will this way avoid that nasty kind of buckling effect that happens when we add too much water to paper. How do you keep from getting blooms? Okay, well, uh, blooms happen and they happen to all of us. The main thing is once you put down your paint and you're happy with how your layer looks, resist the urge to add more. So for example, in the recent tutorial that I'm working on, there were two occasions where I've created blooms where I didn't intend to simply because I started adding more paint before my layer was dry. This has to do with how quickly the pigment travels depending on how wet certain segment of your paper is and I do have a good exercise video that explains this topic in depth and I will link it below so you can see some of the scenarios where blooms happen and how to avoid them. I'm going to paint the antlers and because there's some snow here I will paint around this white snow using negative painting technique. It's just one of the ways to paint snow. I have a more detailed tutorial on snow techniques that I posted a couple of weeks ago so I will leave a link to that one below. But while I'm painting this antler I will tell you a little bit about my whole philosophy on, on watercolor materials because one of the questions that I received and it was very thorough was about the materials that I used. She asks what do you like about the paints paper you choose to use as the main material over something else you have tried? and why do I use these specific paints, brushes and paper. So let's start with the paper because it's really important and the most kind of crucial thing that you need to know as a beginner is that the quality of your paper, meaning how much cotton is in your paper, will make or break your work. And I can't stress this enough and I often repeat myself in videos but I think it always bears repeating because it's so important. Cotton paper is a must because watercolors are simply not not meant to be used on regular paper and what will happen is if you apply watercolors on a surface that's not cotton is not what you expect to see with watercolors at all. It will look muddy, it will look dull and none of the effects you introduce will work and none of it will be your fault. So I often see beginners struggle with this and think oh I'm not good enough and this will never turn out the way I want it, God forbid. You may
might even think oh I don't have the talent so I shouldn't even try it really breaks my heart to be honest because it's really just you're painting on the wrong kind of surface and if you only switched your paper you would be amazed at how good you actually are so I uh, work on cotton paper 100% cotton because I do enjoy a lot of layering you can go down to 50% cotton which is a lot cheaper and it should be enough to have decent paint flow and you can go up to two layers with confidence but if you know that you want to build big beautiful wet on wet washes and maybe uh, more than two layers like you see for the most part in my botanicals then don't compromise you need to get 100% cotton paper in terms of the thickness I work with 140 pounds which is kind of a medium thickness I tried 600 pounds it's a lot more expensive I frankly don't see a lot of difference other than that kind of thick paper never buckles but I can't justify the cost I think 140 pounds at 100% cotton is uh, the best kind of most optimal paper quality and in terms of the brands I really really like Arches of course it's quite famous and I'm really happy with Windsor and Newton paper they have a whole new range that I've tried both in cold pressed and hot pressed very happy and I really like this paper when I have something that doesn't have a background because I can get it in bright white in the block format and the reason why I prefer blocks is because I don't like stretching paper I am always pressed for time and so when it's a block it comes pre-stretched and doesn't buckle as much so back to my original point I would say spend like 75 to 80 percent of your budget on paper having a handful of pigments in one brush but working on cotton paper will give you much much better results than say buying fancy brushes and paints and using them on cellular paper. The finish of your watercolor paper is really up to your style. My preference is for cold pressed paper because it has a little bit of this beautiful grain but it's also smooth enough to add thin lines compared say to a rough finish which is uh, very very grainy and you'll have a hard time adding small details like fur or thin veins on flowers stuff like that. Compared to hot pressed paper cold pressed dries a lot longer so you have a lot more time to work with so I'm going to start my second layer on the mousse now using mostly indigo and burnt sienna and I'm gonna add shadows and fur texture and I will answer some of your other questions regarding the paints we are very fortunate I think to have lots of amazing brands regardless of which part of the world you're in and a really a wide variety of pigments to choose from I work with three brands that I've sort of discovered and tested over the years they are professional grade Daniel Smith, Windsor Newton and Quorn. I have an entire video on my favorite pigments and some specific considerations that you need to be aware of. For example like Quor watercolors are extra extra vibrant in some cases and you may or may not like that look but in general those three brands uh, I absolutely love and highly recommend. I also hear a lot of good things about Senelier, I believe I'm pronouncing it right, and Schmincke, but those were really not available in Canada as widely as uh, the brands that I mentioned before and so I sort of didn't get early exposure to them and uh, now I'm sticking to my favorite three. I have a pretty good collection of pigments. I would say start with dot charts, test the paints, see which ones you like. You may go for more vibrant sets or something more muted and classic like Windsor & Newton. It's entirely up to your style. You don't need the entire range maybe a half a dozen tubes to start with but do test with the dot charts to decide which colors you want to invest in if you are on a budget and you want to go with student grade paints do still go for these well-known well-established brands they have a range of student grade paints that will still give you beautiful results for example Windsor Newton has a line of Cotman watercolors that are really really well made they just have slightly less of a concentration of pigment but they still produce beautiful results avoid student grade paints from lesser known brands because they will give you 
an awful chalky look and interfere with your technique and your learning process. So you have a good sort of option to go with student grade paints that produce good results from well-known brands. And in terms of Cotman, I have a couple of tutorials here on YouTube and I will also link those in the video description below so you can see that even student grade watercolors can produce wonderful results so you don't have to blow your budget on the top top paint brands. And finally, the brushes. This is very straightforward. I really think, especially in the beginning of your watercolor journey, you really just need one or two good round brushes because they take care of everything and, and that's really it. I seriously forget about all the crazy shapes and fancy brands. I worked for probably six or seven years until very recently with just like a round size three and four from Escoda and it was real sable, reason priced and it was enough for this size of work. I, I work on 9 by 12 typically and these days I'm working with synthetic blends. This one's called Kronos from Escoda as well and synthetics are obviously much cheaper. They last longer. The quality of synthetics has really evolved in recent years and the Kronos brushes are a really solid choice. They come in all kinds of shapes shapes like extra long riggers and tiny double zero brushes but do start with just a round brush before you start experimenting with other shapes and maybe get a larger flat one for those big wet on wet washes. For beginners, my advice would be to skip the granulating watercolors completely in the beginning when you're first learning the medium because the granulation effect, although it's very beautiful in one layer work, it really can obscure all the other effects that you might be trying to master and you're much better off with transparent pigments that don't granulate in the beginning. And um, some people may disagree with me in the comments, but I said what I said. I think in terms of my approach to learning watercolors and feeling confident with your results, I think granulating pigments should be set aside in the beginning. They're a whole separate world as far as I'm concerned that requires different techniques and it's better to introduce them slowly over time once you're fully comfortable with the foundational watercolor techniques. Let me know in comments below if you agree or disagree. Hi Anna, how do you decide on your floral compositions? I always struggle with them. Thank you in advance. So <laughs> it's a good question. I uh, will answer briefly and I will have a whole full-length video tutorial on the subject of composition building with step-by-step -step instructions coming out next week. I've been working on it for almost six months and I keep delaying because I really want it to be thorough and actionable for you all. So with all the different examples and scenarios broken down. I promise I will finally push the publish button next weekend. And uh, briefly to answer your question, I introduce a lot of dynamic movement in the floral compositions using the direction of stamps and the general orientation of the flower. So I try to stay away from sort of symmetrical static compositions and I apply one of the key principles from the Chinese Gong Bi style which is called a host and a guest. I talked a little bit about it in some of my other videos but this means basically that I always have some florals that serve as a static background element, the host, and then I add like a guest or an intruder if you will. It can be an insect or a dragonfly or something bigger like a bird or a couple of birds and so that sort of adds a little bit more visual interest and I build around this relationship between the host and the guest but we'll talk more about it in the next video. In the meantime, you can check out uh, some of the online resources on the Gong Bi style. It's absolutely beautiful and a huge inspiration for me. Okay, I finished two layers now and I think because uh, I went a little bit too dark in the beginning, I can't quite add much more to the mousse. So time to break watercolor rule number one and actually add some white up on top where I see snow in the reference photo. So we have all these snow particles all over the back there and I did my best to paint around them but for the most part it's almost impossible to do on such a small 
sheet of paper so I will add white up on top and when you do this my advice is to skip white watercolors and go straight for opaque gouache otherwise it's just going to get absorbed and disappear into the blue and brown gouache on the other hand tends to stay on top and so it looks a lot brighter if you're after that effect okay now i might add some more details in the background just to establish a sense of depth and at that point i think the sketch will be finished. I'm not super happy with how heavy my pigments were in the first layer, but this was a good watercolor workout. Let's call it that and a good practice session. I hope you found this enjoyable. Let me know if you have any follow-up questions in the comments below and I will see you next week with a fresh new video.